So I would like to thank you everyone for uh, joining us today, um, coming to, um, you know, to hear more about uh, race, health and disability during COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, really excited about um, having this discussion. I have three uh, wonderful ladies here um, who will uh, be uh, talking further, you know, about their work, uh, the health disparities that exist, um, what kind of like health policies that needs to um, change need to occur, uh, the vaccine rolled out in more. So um, I have the ladies here, uh, Raquel uh, Banks, um, Dr. Angel Miles, and uh, Representative uh, Sarah Anthony from, um, from Lansing, Michigan. So uh, thank you, ladies, uh, for, for joining me uh, today. It's going to be a really great uh, discussion. So um, um, you know, we have, very, um, have a lot of questions to ask and a great conversation. So I'm not going to um, hold up the process anymore. We just, um, I just get ready uh, to start uh, the, the questions. I know for uh, the audience, if you have any um, questions um, throughout, um, you can leave it in um, the chat and um, I will be able to ask them uh, throughout the uh, discussion and most definitely at the end um, if we have time. So um, uh, the first question um, I would like to ask, and it doesn't matter, you know, who's first to um, answer this, but the first question is, uh, can each person, you know, give me your um, job position and um, how do you address health disparities in your work? Whoever wants to answer that first. Well, I guess I'll go first. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Raquel. I am a first a licensed mortician and a registered nurse. I currently work with one of the health systems in the area and um, I work as a nurse case manager. In my role as a case manager, um, my goal is to help with gaps in care and to hopefully direct patients to resources in the community. Thank you. There we go. Whoever wants to go next. I can go. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Anthony. I serve as state representative for the 68th House District, which includes the city of Lansing and Lansing Township. And um, in this role, as well as my role as the Democratic Caucus Chair, um, I'm in the room helping to craft policies that impact uh, Michiganders with different abilities, um, promoting policies that help close health equity gaps. Um, you know, right now I'm the co-lead on the caucus efforts to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, before this time I served on a, as, the, uh, as an Ingham County Commissioner. And in every job that I've always had, I can't help but use an equity lens when approaching the work. Um, it's just in my bones, it's in my DNA. And so whether we're promoting policies that hopefully turn into laws that impact people with different abilities, or we're actually tackling all sorts of issues that may not be so narrowly focused, doing so with the lens for all populations, all people from all walks of life, um, is just how we need to approach this work. And so I'm proud to work alongside our governor who has, you know, created and empowered several task forces that um, focus on equity and inclusion and also working um, on the House side here in the legislature to try to, again, move legislation along that makes a more equitable Michigan. So thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. And Angel. Hi, um, everyone. My name is Dr. Angel Love Miles. I am a healthcare and home and community-based services policy analyst at Access Living, which is a center for independent living 
um, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I will give a, a, a visual description for those who will benefit for it at home. So um, I'm a black woman, I have locks and short hair and I have a purple sweater uh, that's kind of glittery. And I'm sitting in a wheelchair because I'm a wheelchair user. And in the background is like a white wall with um, uh, a poster that says class of 17 when I graduated from grad school. And um, I'm just really happy to be here. Some of the things that uh, I do I, uh, as a health care and home and community-based services policy analyst at Access Living is that I, I sit on a number of coalitions uh, with a number of organizations in the Chicago land community to help advocate uh, for people with disabilities, um, equitable access to health care and home and community-based services. Uh, organizations such a uh, coalition such as uh, Northwestern University has an alliance for research in Chicago land communities and so um, I advocate there to make sure that people with disabilities have equitable access to health care within uh, the, the Northwestern uh, medical model uh, and we primarily serve people of color with disabilities is, is who we primarily serve. So we're always taking an intersectional lens uh, at, with everything that we do. Uh, we work closely with legislators um, and, and we advocate for the passage of policies and practices that are inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, and we like to say people with disabilities, at least in our, um, in our practice, because um, we think it's important that um, that we claim disability and that there's nothing to emphasize that there's nothing wrong with being disabled, but it's, some, it's something wrong with the way that people think about disability. And um, yeah, those are just a, a few of the things that we do. And I'm just really grateful to be here with all of you. Yes, 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 yes. All of you like you do wonderful, wonderful work. So I'm really, really excited. Uh, so, you know, the, the other question that you know, we talk about, you know, health disparities and, and of course with the title, uh, race and health and disability, and we know those things uh, affect each other. So uh, just to get the conversation started, in your opinion, and you know, any of you um, or all of you can answer this question. Um, how does, you know, race and disability affect people's health pre-COVID? Okay, well, I'll try and go first. Okay. I think for me as a nurse, as a nurse case manager, um, working at the time in a doctor's office, I noticed that it was uh, a lot of it was the access to care, the access to resources, um, even the grocery store and the transportation to a doctor's office. I saw those as challenges um, pre-COVID. Um, the affor affording, being able to afford uh, the medications and um, transfer again transportation. Uh, or, or just utilities. Those were some challenges I noticed uh, pre-COVID that still affected health uh, of patients in the community. Yes. And wh what about you, um, Aja? What, what did you um, see like pre-COVID for uh, people with disabilities? Um, so for people of color disabilities particularly, um, we already know that uh, Black and Indigenous people um, had the highest rates of disability uh, in the country. And those that's not a, a natural outcome. Those are um, directly related to, to social determinants of health. And, and so, um, for example, in the case of African Americans, African Americans have high, uh, um, higher rates of poverty, um, are less likely to be insur insured, uh, are uh, more likely to, to be in dangerous jobs. And so all those issues um, make it harder to, make it more likely that you will acquire a disability, uh, make it harder to rehabilitate a disability if you do 
acquire it. So th those issues contribute to higher rates of disabilities. Uh, you know, uh, black women uh, have you know higher mortality rates uh, when it comes to pregnancy and you know experience pregnancy disparities. And you know, uh, we, we talk about that, but we don't often talk about the disability implications of that. And and not only you know black women. Um, dying, but black women who do survive and either acquire disabilities themselves or their children do, and so um, so those are some of the ways that that disability affects uh, people of color in general and black people dis with disabilities and in particularly. In addition, people of color um, are more likely to receive services from people who are not from their community, and mm -hmm. so um, and and namely. Uh, uh, white people and so their doctors are more likely to be white their rehabilitation counselors are more likely to be white the people who do their assessment for medicare and medicaid and decide whether they get services and resources are more likely to be white or or non-people um the, well non-people colors white or or in the case of black people uh you know non-black um so uh so racism and and anti-blackness and other types of racism uh will impact the, the likelihood of accessing resources because people have uh, unconscious biases that impact whether they give resources um, mm -hmm. to people of color disabilities. And so all those things impact uh, the disparities that, that people of color disabilities experience in general um, and that black and indigenous people with disabilities especially will uh, experience, unfortunately. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. That that's very much true. So like with, with what uh, with what Raquel said, and you know, Doctor Hager Bouse has said too. And uh, and so I work for um, Oba and uh, work for Healthy Dearborn in particular. So I learned about public health, and you know, and so for the audience, and like what they're talking about too, in public health, they term it as social determinants of health. So what social determinants of health is that, you know, our, um, how, you know, our health is based not on all about like personal choice, but it's based on our environment. So, you know, so like access to food, um, access to hospitals, access, you know, to walkable communities, you know, so our social environments is, you know, has a lot to do with our health um, as well. So that's just a little bit background, which, you know, Raquel and, and Dr. Uh, H. Miles, you definitely perfectly have, have illustrated. Uh, so Representative Anthony, have you seen, uh, you know, which I'm sure you have when, when it comes to formulated health policies pre-COVID based on race and um, disability? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Angel and Raquel, you know, hit the nail on the head when it comes time to talking about those disparities that, you know, that the whole adage is that when America gets a cold, Black America gets the flu. And that was all illuminated during the COVID-19 crisis or pandemic. But even before that, right, you know, all the statistics, you already heard these statistics about, you know, people with dis that more that Black Michiganders um, are slightly more likely than other racial groups to have a disability here in Michigan. And then people with disabilities generally report, you know, higher rates of chronic conditions. Many of that were linked to COVID-19. So we shouldn't have been surprised, right, that COVID-19 would disproportionately impact these communities, right? When you think about things like obesity, smoking, diabetes, asthma, depression, COPD, um, you know, cancer, kidney disease, asthma, all of those things are more prevalent, um, mainly around black and brown folks, and then layer on folks with disabilities, and it really became kind of a perfect storm, right? And unfortunately, many of our policies and practices and how we treat um, our people are seen through lenses that are inherently racist, are inherently biased. Um, there are barriers and obstacles that are put before communities that, um, you talked about the social determinants of health. I mean, it, it's in the air we breathe. It's the water we drink. You know, what do you do 
when it's literally in and around every single system that you are built, that you are in, that you that you start to see that these systems are, are designed um, in a way that leaves certain communities behind. And so we absolutely saw that pre-COVID, um, you know, the intersection between race and disability, I mean, it was all there, it was all there. Yeah, and, and that's, that's very much true. So now, you know, with during COVID and um, all of your, your work, have you seen any, any of these elements change? Like for example, um, I know there's telehealth uh, that you know occurs now, uh, especially during the midst of you know, the heart of COVID, but even like during like right now. So, um, do you see the, do you see those elements changes access to like telehealth for people um, with disabilities of color? You know, say you see what I'm saying. Do you see yeah. any of the changes? Or yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, there's always good news and bad news, right? Um, I'll start with the good news, right? The good news is that, you know, under this governor's administration and other folks that are around the administration and the legislature, we started to name the thing, right? We declared racism as a public health crisis. We, um, you know, began putting together task force. There's the coronavirus task force on racial disparities that started to really dig into these disparities and figure out how we can address them. They started to do some of the work, right? Um, increasing neighborhood and employer testing sites. You talked about the telehealth, making it a little more accessible. Um, actually thinking about strategically how to communicate with, with communities of color, right? Um, distributing masks to, you know, what they call vulnerable populations. Uh, so there were some nuances and some strategies that were put in place um, by design in order to start to fill some of those gaps. That's the good news. The bad news is not enough. <laughs> the bad news is that we need more. Um, we need to rev up. We need to be more strategic. We need to um, ensure that we're reaching every single population, um, not only in addressing some of the underlying symptoms, but also the other parts of the pandemic, right? Right down to vaccine distribution. Um, if we're not using an equity lens to actually address every part of the pandemic, even after this passes, and Lord knows we need it to pass, will we be ready for the next crisis? Will we not learn from these, um, these last few months and go back to business as usual where those gaps still exist? So I hope that we haven't just declared racism a public health crisis and said all the right things. And then we go back to business as usual in which communities of color and black and brown folks who are disabled end up being left behind yet again. Yeah, 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 that's very much, very much true. And I often, you know, have wondered, you know, that the same thing, you know, with, with all of this awareness and exposure and talking about it and everything like that, you know, is our these are going to, you know, begin to change even even more so definitely uh to be continued that's that's for certain um and, you know Raquel do you have um uh, as far as your opinion have you seen any of the elements um change as far as with access it's, uh, it's been my concern though with telehealth which is a wonderful thing that everyone can stay at home and still get some kind of care from their primary care doctor but it's still, again, having that access to it, understanding how to use your cell phone or your computer, or, or do you have the, the, the capabilities to still reach the physician? And that, that has been a challenge. I know even with my parents, um, they still struggle um, with using the, the internet or um, even initiating that telehealth visit. So that's, Still is a, a is a challenge and I listen to my mom who talks about well my you know my internet bill has now gone up and so so that makes it again a bigger challenge for people to to make that connection even with telehealth um, when they're looking at the finances to, to, to use it so again it's a great thing but then there's still some negatives that come into play so they can continue to, to, to access their physician if the physician is using only that way to take care of the patient. 
What's your name? What about you? Um, uh, I think that there's um, quite a few barriers, including the digital divide that's really, um, you know, concerning. So it's great if, uh, you know, telehealth exists, but if you don't have the internet, you can't afford the internet, or if you don't have an actual tablet or a computer, um, you know, it's not really going to do you any good. And then in the case of people with disabilities, um, we need all sorts of accommodations with using um, telehealth. So, you know, if you are deaf or hard of hearing and you need ASL interpretation, you know, you have to set that up with your doctor ahead of time and or you need CART, et cetera. And, you know, a, a lot of medical um, institutions are just not prepared and knowledgeable about about how to do those things. Uh, and, and then if you're in a nursing home, again, uh, where, where the, the uh, pandemic has really ravaged uh, uh, people who are uh, aging and people with disabilities, especially people of color, um, again, many of those places don't have uh, access to the internet or, or uh, technology and, and computers and et cetera. And even if they, do, um, they are um, people with disabilities uh, and, and other residents uh, access to those tools are dependent on, you know, other people um, allowing them to access them. And, and so there's just so many, uh, there's so many layers to it, but it is a, it is a good sign that telehealth is becoming more available. And I'm hopeful that after this pandemic, that it, it is um, something that we invest in uh, more uh, because it's it's needed um, re re regardless of, of COVID-19 or not. It just has a lot of benefits, but there's a, a lot to think about in terms of uh, accessing it. Yeah, yeah, see, we, see what you say. And, and when I was listening, I know, uh, Angel, you were talking about uh, like with the nursing homes and, and, and such. So and, and it's like, you know, which is not surprising, but it was very heartbreaking to see that that, you know, nobody was prepared to handle, you know, say the nursing homes and, and, and such. So do, you know, in your opinion, if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, what happened, if, if you're able to talk about more about what the nursing homes and what can, you know, the communities do, you know, um, well, that's just that we can learn next time around when it comes to dealing with, um, you know, black people and you know, people in nursing home. Uh, I think that, you know, we really need to have a national conversation about nursing homes. I think that there's um, a real misunderstanding within our culture about, um, you know, their, their value and, and how they, how they treat people. Um, and, and, and especially in the black community, we need to really know that you have other options and they're called home and community-based services. And you don't have to put your loved ones in a nursing home. Um, there are resources available that will allow your loved one to live at home um, with supports. And, and that really is uh, preferable um, for people um, with disability and who are aging to be able to continue to live in the community. And there's so many people who really do not desire to be in a nursing home and really do not need to be in nursing homes, but are only there um, because they don't know of other options. Uh, and because our society has not invested in home and community-based services. Um, right now, people with disability and the aging have, have a right to be institutionalized. They do not have a right to live in the community. Like that's how policy is written. And so we, um, you know, with Medicaid waivers, the waiver uh, allows for uh, people to uh, use Medicaid money to live in the community that would otherwise be used to support them in, in nursing homes. And we need to change that mentality and actually prioritize uh, services in the community. Um, and so it's not a surprise that, you know, pan the pandemic has, has been so difficult in nursing homes because it's just an, a, a reasonable outcome to the inequity, inequities um, that already exist. And, and so, um, you know, we really need to, to work on 
changing the dialogue and the conversation and educating, especially communities of color about the resources that are available um, to live in the community. So, so let's say uh, a, a, a person is watching currently right now and they have an elderly uh, parent, you know, that they don't want to put into a nursing home or you might have someone who uh, get, who's just recently injured or, you know what I'm saying, things like that. How would they go about accessing community-based um, housing? Uh, I would say that they can... Uh, contact their social worker, uh, they can contact centers for independent living in their area, uh, they're to you know, contact um, the Center for Medicaid Services, they, and, you know, and look at their website and learn more about uh, the resources that are available um, to, to aging people. You can contact the Department of Aging, you can contact the Department of Rehabilitation in, in your state. So um, there's a number of uh, resources available that will tell you about your right to live in the community and what's possible for you and your loved ones. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Because you know, like, like I said before, it's just so heartbreaking, you know, to see you know, what has happened. And I know they, you know, people are living in nursing homes and, you know, um, and the people who work there uh, are the first to get vaccines, which we will uh, talk about within a few minutes about the vaccine rollout. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so if we talk about, you know, models that, um, that does help people of color with disabilities, uh, can you think of any models like healthcare models or anything that you are doing currently at your job that you have seen is working um, in the community to help um, people of color with disabilities? Um, anyone can answer Raquel, you can start us off. Well, the, the only uh, thing that I can think of at this point is um, so a resource guide that I use would be like Aunt Bertha. Um, we can put in what you're what you're in need of, and that can connect people to to resources. Um, within my department, um, we do have a social worker that helps connect patients to to re, again resources in the community. Um, but those are some of the 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 tools that we use um, to make that connection for all all our patients. Um, and then we go through the you know asking questions about the SDOH. Um, and, and seeing where a person's need is. So again, some of the tools that we use to help people find those resources. Yeah, that's really, you know, that's much, very much needed to connect, commute, connect people to, you know, the resources to help them. Um, Representative Anthony, um, are there any current uh, laws uh, that you um, currently, you know, going through right now or that exists that really, in your opinion, has helped people? You know, so we're still new in this term. Um, so there hasn't been much that we've voted on quite yet. Um, there were some pieces that were pu pushed by groups like Michigan Protection and Advocacy, um, Disability Rights Coalition, Disability Network, um, that uh, I think we're laser focused on one, making sure that our existing programs are well resourced, right? You know, it's one thing to create different programs and services, and then they don't have the budgets, they don't have the staff, they don't have any of the, the stuff to actually make sure that they're serving people, right? So I think, especially in this budget cycle, I, I, last term I was on the appropriations process and, and we all know budgets are moral documents, right? You, you tell me that you care, show me the money, show me how you're going to support those priorities. So I think that even this year, you know, folks who are interested in making sure that folks in the disability community have what they need um, particularly from uh, like Department of Health and Human Services, but e even all of our departments should be looking at those budgets and making sure that there are resources dedicated. Um, you know, one bill that I've personally been championing and, and we're getting closer to it uh, reaching the light of day is one related to chemical restraint. 
you know, the fact that in many nursing homes or lawn care um, health facilities um, and homes, oftentimes folks are being uh, overly medicated, not because they need medication, but as a way to discipline uh, communities, right? Our senior citizens, folks with disabilities. And you guessed it, many of those times they disproportionately are over medicating black and brown folks, right? And so that is just one bill that I'm personally trying to champion to see make it across the finish line is to address chemical restraint. Um, even just the perception, right? You'll see a black or brown um, man or woman and think that they are more aggressive, right? So you have to give them more medication as opposed to looking at their medical charts and seeing, okay, what else is in there that might actually impact um, how we you know, interact with this patient. So there's lots of bills that we can be looking at those very practical ones, but then also making sure that our budgets, um, again, are, are giving the resources to the programs that already exist through the state. Yes, yes, sounds really great. Yes, uh, Angel, uh, what are you, currently do or any models that you see that really um, is working in the community? Um, I think that, you know, certainly like the social model of disability is just really important. And, and, and that just says, you know, that we look beyond, you know, the medical model, but, uh, and stop thinking about just um, impaired bodies, but thinking about uh, how society uh, imposes limitations on people who have disabilities and so how how people are disabled by society and not their conditions themselves um, and so and so that's a model that's that's really important because oftentimes when we're only thinking about the medical model we're only thinking about cure we're only thinking about like COVID-19 and how to get a vaccine but we're not thinking about um, the social factors that 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 contributed to why a vaccine is needed in, in the first place. Uh, and so uh, I think the social model is really um, very important. Um, you know, also intersectionality as a framework is, is really important to everything that we do, um, particularly in, in disability policy, because, um, you know, unfortunately, like disability policy just tends to think about disability and doesn't think about how not all communities uh, have been able to benefit from disability policy uh, to the same degree. And so we really need to think about disability policy, um, health policy, um, you know, in an in a, in a intersectional way, um, racial justice uh, policy in an intersectional way that's inclusive of people with disabilities. So always thinking, you know, who are we leaving leaving out. Um, I really appreciate it, uh, Representative Anthony talking about, you know, how, um, you know, many places have started to think about uh, race uh, and equality as a, a, a health, uh, a, a health emergency. Uh, but at the same time, you know, nationally, you know, we've been you know, coming into barriers because we had an administration that was simultaneously, you know, denying that, um, you know, racial inequality should be a priority and really creating policies that, that undercut a lot of the civil rights uh, uh, gains that we have, have made over, over time. And so, unfortunately, uh, citizens throughout the country have been getting a mixed message. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, we will be able to um, from from the federal government onto local government, um, get a get a unified vision that uh, racial inequality, you know, is is a threat to to health care uh, and to health inequality, and um, and that disability and other systems of inequality um, intersect with that, and so um, that is my hope, and that I think when that happens, we'll see less of these disparities. Yes, yes, yes. You broke it down for us. <laughs> Definitely broke it down. Uh, so, you know, speaking of, you know, when it comes to the vaccines, I know that they say, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Fucci and, you know, other infectious disease uh, have said that this is the only way, you know, for us to even get out of this, you know, pandemic is if, you know, over 80% 
for such Americans um, get the vaccine. So I just wanted to spend a couple uh, minutes right quick um, to to talk about that. Um, so with with the vaccine, what are you what are your thoughts around you know the vaccine safety? You know that's 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 one question. And then the second question is, what do you think about the road out? Because um, you know, it seems like some people do not have access, who I think should have access to the vaccines right now. So, what is what do you think about the vaccine safety? What do you think about the rollout? I'll, I'll just say a couple of words, and obviously, I'm not a doctor. You know, and I haven't gotten the vaccine yet, but I do plan on getting the vaccine um, when my number is called. But um, I won't skip in line in front of folks who are first responders, folks who are, you know, 65 and up, who are, are working every day um, in the healthcare industry. I, I will wait my turn, um, but when my turn comes, I do plan on uh, getting the vaccine. I, I think a few things, right? Since we're talking about um, an equity lens, you know, I think the last study I saw was that 60% of Black folks um, said that they were less likely than other groups. Um, to get the vaccine, right? And I think that the there needs to be an acknowledgement about the distrust uh, in the Black community around certain medical procedures and medicines. And a lot of that's based in just the history uh, of this country as it relates to African-Americans and healthcare. I mean, Tuskegee and Henrietta Lacks, I mean, it's rooted in truth, right? So that acknowledgement needs to be there. At the same time, I think that it's up to the government, up to folks in healthcare to make the case to black and brown communities, right? Um, to do the work, educate, provide resources. You know, there should be, you know, healthcare advocates that are deployed in our communities to explain the benefits, right? It's not just about shaming folks into getting a vaccine. It's about taking folks along a journey and letting them know here are the pros, right? If this COVID-19 has just ravaged through our black communities, right? There is an obligation, a moral obligation for the experts, our, our, our best and brightest healthcare professionals to try to help solve the problem. And so I think that there is something Sorry. So I think that there's something really important about all of us being good ambassadors of truth in this moment, but acknowledging where folks are as well um, and how that distrust and mistrust is rooted in more than just superstitions and feelings. It's rooted in fact-based discrimination um, throughout this nation's history. So, and in terms of the rollout, um, you know, I think we can always find room to do better, right? We, we have to do better. I think that it, it needs to be faster. It needs to be swifter. It needs to be more deliberate. Resources need to be, uh, I think, disproportionate uh, by nature of where COVID-19 has hit most, right? If it went through places like, you know, Wayne County, Oakland, Macomb, places like Lansing, Urban Cores, well, that's what we need to have more shots in arms, right? Um, that's how we get to a sense of normalcy even um, faster. I, I think the last uh, thing I saw was instead of trying to do a, a trickle approach just everywhere, just sprinkle vaccines everywhere, let's do a downpour in the places we know need it, right? Uh, but again, I'm not an expert. I'm not the ones that are managing the logistics, but um, I do think that this is going to be a good first step. And, and I don't want us to be a year or two years removed from this moment. And because of so much distrust, we have marginalized communities still dying of COVID-19, right? That is my fear. And, and I don't want us to be there in 2022, 2023. I want us to get back to a sense of normalcy as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with Representative Anthony, and I'm just trying to, trying to guess and trying to figure out how do we get to that point where in 2022, we will, you know, we all will be safe to go out and play um, because we have the, the history and the, the lack of trust that to have that herd immunity, we have to get people to feel comfortable uh, getting the vaccine. So 
I, I have some friends who have received the vaccine based on their their jobs. They are they're in healthcare as well, and um, you know they're telling people this is how I felt. This is how things are going, and that that helps. That helps in the process of, of moving things forward. So I agree with Representative Anthony. Yes, maybe we should have had more available in those communities that had the the bigger impact by the virus. That would have been great. But here we are. And we're working with who we at, but I do, I do think again, like we were saying, access to if my internet is not working, I might not get that email that says, "Hey, your lot, your number has come up," and then so now we're still in a little in a challenge of getting everyone um, vaccinated um, in t in time to make a difference. Yeah, yeah, that that is true. You have to, to yeah, with the email. That's definitely a barrier. And I know particularly for people uh, with disabilities, like people with um, Down syndrome and autism, um, they are an increase of the chance of dying from COVID, but they are scheduled, I think, in um, the third batch with people with underlying health conditions. So there is uh, currently um, like an advocacy um, a campaign or on uh, from Detroit Disability Power uh, to you know encourage the contact legislators to um, particularly in Michigan you know to ask them to put you know people with Down syndrome and you know those type of disabilities that they're ten times more likelier to die from COVID and put them in the uh, front of the list alongside other people who's being vaccinated now. So I definitely want to um, mention that um, campaign that's going on. Um, um, uh, Dr. Angel, what, what, what do you think um, about vaccine safety in the rollout? Um, I mean, there's so many things to think about. Uh, I think that, you know, one thing that we need to remember is that, you know, race discrimination in healthcare, you know, is in our is in our history, it's our present, like it's still happening. Mm -hmm. And so like uh, people of color, they don't trust the, the, the medical profession, uh, you know, it, it's for good reason and, and they've earned our distrust. <laughs> and so they have to also earn our trust. And so, you know, just, just to point to a recent story with uh, Michael Hickson, who was a black man with spinal cord uh, injury uh, who lived in Texas and um, he had uh, COVID-19 and he was refused um, further medical care uh, because the doctors said that, you know, because he had a disability that his quality of life was automatically, you know, um, not very much. And so they didn't even try to save him they didn't um he, he could have had a ventilator and they didn't even try to save him and so that was um you know an example of both uh you know race and disability discrim discrimination and, and so um you know there's a lot that needs to happen to to change biases within uh, medical professions um but it, but until that happens there's going to be distress and in the meantime, I would say to, to communities of color um, to, to do what they, we need to do what we can to educate um, each other um, and to inform each other from a community perspective um, for those of us who, who do know. Um, and so I, I was able and fortunate to get the, the vaccine um, after I you know, learned more about the vaccine and, and what it is and, um, and my number came up and um, you know, I feel fine. And, um, you know, I was a little tired the next day and a little, a little achy, but I feel fine. And I will encourage everyone um, to, to take the vaccine because we don't want this, uh, we don't want histories and current um, practices of uh, discrimination to, to further privilege other groups, you know, to work in their to work in their benefit, um, and so uh, we we have to resist that. That yes, we have good reasons to not um, trust the medical profession, but we also have good reason to believe in the safety and efficacy of this vaccine. Um, you know, we know that that a black woman helped to create the vaccine, and um, you know that's something that you know should give us hope and 
And I really would encourage um, all marginalized groups to really take the vaccine. I mean, all people who in general, but especially marginalized groups because we're more at risk. Yes, 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 most definitely that. And I took the vaccine as well. And, um, and so it was, I was, you know, my heart was sore and, and such, but um, afterwards a little bit more sore than the, the flu shot. But, um, but yeah, it's just, you know, we, we just, you know, we have to, you know, I know, I would say in spite of the past because, you know, you can't change, you know, past happened, but, you know, we have to find ways, okay, we want to get done with this pandemic. So, you know, let's take the vaccine the apps show that it is um, safe and such. So, uh, most definitely, as, as, as we speak about, you know, the history um, and, and your opinions, and all of you um, can answer this as well. Uh, what is the most important step that healthcare providers can do to make, to become better partners with people with disabilities of color to improve their health and wellness? Um, well, I mean, there's a number of things that we need. Uh, so one thing that we really need is data. Um, we need, we need numbers, uh, people with disabilities aren't being counted. Uh, and you know, you know, we are getting uh, more and more data about people of color, but, and we don't even, and we still don't have enough of that consistently, but we have very little data about people with disabilities and the way that the disability is even, um, counted is not consistent. And, and so like if, if one survey defines disability one way, but another survey defines it a different way, you can't uh, make comparisons you know, across. And so one, we have to really recognize disabled people as a minority group, as a marginalized group that experiences discrimination and not just as a medical category. And so that's like one thing that's really important. And another thing that's important is really looking at uh, places that are uh, that provides medical services and making sure that they are accessible and really considering accessibility as a social determinant of health as well. And so, if you know, if a facility is not accessible, then then people with disabilities cannot receive health care. If if the if the examination table does not you know lower, then then they can't be examined if they're a wheelchair user. Uh, you know, if if mammogram machines aren't accessible to people who are um, to little persons, people who are short stature like myself, or people who are wheelchair users, then they they can't get a get a breast exam. Uh, if if ASL interpretation isn't available, et cetera. So, so really thinking about accessibility as a social determinant of health as well and, think, and making sure that these vaccine sites are accessible, which is something um, that we're doing at Access Living is really you know, advocating to uh, make sure that vaccine sites are accessible and that, uh, that people who work at them are receiving the training to, to understand uh, accessibility issues. Uh, so that's something that we're also advocating for. And, and also just uh, healthcare providers just getting the training that they need um, and consistent training. It's not like, you know, one class that you take on diversity and you, you, you have it. Um, you have to constantly be reintroduced to, uh, you know, cultural competency and, and learn about, you know, about uh, the spectrum of difference and how that uh, affects your work. Learning about uh, unconscious bias, really, and, and how that, uh, or implicit bias, I, I, I actually prefer the term implicit <laughs> bias, uh, and, and, and learning how that may affect your work. Um, and so just constantly um, being self-reflective and learning about how you can be just a better citizen and, uh, and, and, and that includes myself and, and thinking about not only the areas in which I'm marginalized, 
but the areas in which I have privilege and and really thinking about you know how um, I may be contributing to to the oppression of someone else so so that's what I would say that's great uh, yeah Raquel how do you I know because I know you have really good um, examples of partnering so would you like to add anything to it like you know, how can healthcare providers uh, partner with uh, people with disabilities and, you know, chronic illnesses as well, you know, uh, as far as with their health and wellness? Well, I think Dr. Ant, uh, Dr. Miles did a great job at um, elaborating on that, on that topic. Um, but I, I do hope that um, healthcare systems do a, a better job at diversity, um, and inclusion uh, and educating their staff. Um, that, that's a huge one for me um, with, with all the systems that I work, I've worked for in the past is them providing that education to the staff so they can look beyond themselves and see other people. And so I think that, that is, that is a, a, a big factor for me um, is, is again, the education of, of the staff, of, of physicians, of nurses, and, and making sure, again, like we said earlier, making sure there's accessibility for everyone. Yes, 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 that's, that's very much, very much true. Um, so we have a question that came in um, from one of the uh, people who's watching uh, right now. Um, and the question is, are more cases of discrimination being denoted in regard to um, showing biases, um, showing biases regarding quality of life concerning uh, persons with disabilities. So this kind uh, of goes back to what Dr. Miles was talking about, which is the need for data, right? Um, the fact that when you know black folks, black folks with disabilities, lift up their voices in you know, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, in the workplace, um, in educational settings, in all these settings, the lack of data sometimes doesn't um, illustrate the reality that's going on in these spaces, right? Um, even us as lawmakers, you know, I have been one that has fought for more data, right? Um, boilerplate in the appropriations process that you won't spend a dime of this state money unless these things are uh, collected and disaggregated, not just by race, but by you know ability, right? And so until we have those uh, real concrete thought out data sets and also those not just collecting it, but using it to inform practices, inform budgetary decisions, we won't be able to give life and really answer those questions with fidelity. So I, th I think that, you know, we can talk about some isolated cases. We, we do have anecdotal data. There is, you know, some research on, on all of these topics, but we need to beef up the data sets in order to really address these issues with fidelity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very much, very much true that the data is not really there. So yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Miles, for bringing that up. Um, did you want to add anything? More to it, um, Dr. Miles, I think we pretty much. No, I, I mean, I think that uh, Representative Anthony really explained it well. It's just a cut 22 of, you know, we want to address these issues, at, but then where is the data? Um, and, and so, but we do have, you know, we can use the information that we do have to, to, to make inferences and, and everything, but no, I think it's an issue. It's an issue of power in in a way because um, um, you know some groups in power don't want data to be collected because they know that that leads to resources um, to communities. And so you know, you know, there's always two things happening where um, one group is is fighting to be heard, but then simultaneously there's another group that's fighting to make sure that never happens. And so. Uh, and so, you know, we have to be aware of that and really come with some good strategies um, because there were uh, a lots of purposeful barriers that were put in place to make sure that the data for marginalized people um, 
isn't uh, collected. And, and sometimes it's purposeful and sometimes it's not because you have to remember that most people who do research are not disabled, are not people of color. And so they're, they, again, implicit bias, they're, they're not thinking about, you know, I should collect disability data, you know, because they're thinking about disability in terms of only medical and not really, you know, as a group that experiences discrimination. So there's a number of factors, but us as a community is, is, and as advocates, um, you know, really need to, to work harder in our activism to try to, make, to raise the issue and to educate each other about, you know, why these issues exist. Uh, and there's, there's one other area of marginalization that I, I haven't mentioned, which is uh, people, you know, immigration status and people who are undocumented and, and really thinking about, you know, how we have, um, you know, millions of people here in our, in our society that are contributing to, to our society, but um, don't have equitable access to resources and opportunities um, because they don't, they're not considered uh, citizens, and that is also an issue of power. And and a lot, a large amount of those people are people of color and are still people with disabilities. So we really need to keep in mind that, and to not assume when we're talking about disability policy that that's something that um, that everyone has access to. That there's still a large amount of people who who fit who don't fit in, um, that that model. Um, and we need to be thinking about like who are we. Who are we missing out? And so, in multiple cases, those are people who are undocumented, or those are people who are homeless, or those are people who are incarcerated. And so, also, you know, just always thinking about the margins within the margins, and and really um, trying to have a bottom up approach to who to addressing these issues. Yes, 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 most definitely. Thank you. And and, and so that brings me to you know we have you know, a new administration, you know, we talked about, you know, the vaccine, we talked about, you know, the health, the health disparities before COVID, you know, and, and during COVID. And so, you know, we, like I said, we're under a new administration. So um, I would like to know from all of you, uh, from, you know, what kind of healthcare policies would you like to see um, from coming from the Biden the Harris administration. Thank you, Ms. Well, that Representative Anthony may have more information. I thoughts on that, but I am I am hoping that the uh, Affordable Care Act will be um, uh, available for everyone soon to look at and make decisions about what what they're in need of specifically. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on that just yet. I'm still trying to develop my ideas on that one, what I'm looking for, what I'm hoping for. Um, but I'm definitely hoping that there'll be educational opportunities for, for people. And we're looking beyond those uh, comorbidities that people have had or pre-existing diseases that people are coming in with, so. You know, y'all know I got a list. <laughs> <laughs> Of high expectations, you know, you know, President Biden uh, created that health uh, equity task force, you know, and I have high hopes. I don't want to see another task force that has no meat, that does not come up with actual bold solutions that impact the actual lives of people. So I want to make, I want to see that manifest into something real. Um, I want this administration to address our mental health crisis. Um, the fact that we still see mental health as not holistic health care and we underfund it at the state and federal level. So I want someone to actually address that for finally. Um, I, I, I hope that they take a look at lowering prescription drug costs yeah. uh, out through the roof, right? I mean, people are dying because they can't afford to live. Um, Life-saving drugs are out of, the, out of our reach. That in a country like America, that just shouldn't be the conversations we're having right now. So I, I want them to address that um, maternal mor uh, mortality rates. I want them to set up real, concrete protections um, for healthcare needs for our LGBTQ communities. I mean, I, I have a whole list. <laughs> we got a lot to do, but I think that if we you know, lift up everyone and take care of everyone's holistic health needs, 
and then do so with an equity lens, we'll be okay, right? We often try to chunk out these pieces and say, we're going to deal with mental health. We're going to deal with Black women's health. We're going to deal. Instead, let, don't cover the whole system and then do it, build it better um, through a more equitable lens. So um, that's the real wonky answer, the real, you know, flowery answer. But I think that I have confidence that this administration is approaching it from the right um, lens. And I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm more hopeful than I have been in the last eight years. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this, um, this is Angel. So I'm relieved <laughs> and I have, and I have hope. Um, but like, I, I, I'm a pessimist, hopeful person, I suppose. Um, you know, because I, you know, am, um, you know, very progressive. And so I, of course, you know, it would be great if we expand uh, the Affordable Care Act and, you know, and ensure that, you know, people with pre-existing conditions, um, you know, are able to get th their health care, um, you know, and make, make uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act uh, more, more affordable, actually more affordable um, for people to use. So I definitely want to see that happen. But more than that, you know, I want single payer. I want, um, you know, universal health care. I want health care to be um, established as a right in this country and not a privilege. Um, and, you know, until that happens, like, we're going to continue to to experience, uh, you know, significant disparities. You know, COVID-19 should be a wake-up call that we cannot afford to have, you know, large segments of our population that, you know, are experiencing, you know, health inequality because it puts us all at risk. Uh, you know, it puts us all at risk. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that eventually we'll come to that conclusion. I know, you know, a lot of people are, you know, believe that that's not realistic, but, you know, um, people, many didn't believe that civil rights was realistic or that, you know, passing Medicare was realistic, you know, and, and or, or, or that a, a woman of color vice president was realistic and here we are. And so I believe that, uh, you know, that universal health care, that single payer will happen in my lifetime. I'm certainly going to fight for it. But in the meantime, um, you know, definitely pushing on our current uh, administration to deliver on its promises and and then some would be would be my focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very much very much true. You know, I'm very help, hopeful. You know, as well. I was a sigh of relief <laughs> to me. That's to say the least. You know, um, to see uh, Biden, President Biden, and and Harris up there, and I believe they're gonna you know do as much as they uh, could do. So, you know, towards we winding down to the end um, of the discussion. So if anybody else has uh, any questions, uh, please go, uh, you know, put it uh, at the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition uh, Facebook page. Um, and you can post it um, underneath the video, your questions, and we'll um, answer them. So um, as far as you know, with you talk about all these different things. So what do you hope the lessons um, that we can learn from COVID-19? So, you know, it's like a year from now, five years from now, 10, 20 years from now, what do you, uh, what lessons do you hope um, that we will learn about COVID? I think there are so many. I think there are so many different lessons that need to be learned or hopefully have been learned from this. Um, as a mortician, I'm hoping people will have more time to think about advanced directives and, and really talking about end of life. Um, those are things we didn't really discuss before COVID-19, but now we see the impact of not discussing those things and that maybe we'll put more time in, um, having those insurance policies and things like that set aside. Um, that's something I, as the mortician, I hope comes out of it. As a nurse, I'm hoping we'll put more time in, in exercising and watching what we eat and, and um, really taking time to be with family. And so maybe, you know, foregoing 
certain activities so we can spend more time with with your with our families and and forgoing what we usually eat at those family picnics when we get to have those again and and making healthier food choices because that that too makes a difference in those people that are dealing with COVID-19 and their recovery from COVID-19 is how healthy are we so um Th those are some things I'm hoping for that we will have those opportunities to to make and see those changes in our health and in our in our conversation about preparing for end of life and preparing for those for those unforeseen situations that come up due to COVID or any other health tragedies. Um, but those are conversations I think we as people are have not really had, but. I'm hoping we can have those conversations now. Of how how much exercise am I going to do? And have more health exercise challenges amongst your friends and things like that. So those are the things I'm hoping for will come out of this. Yes. Episode of Kathy. You know, it, it it shouldn't take a global pandemic for us to have these conversations. For us to, you know declare racism a public health crisis. It was a healthcare crisis before the pandemic. Right. Um, it shouldn't take a pandemic for us to start to realize we need to adequately invest um, in communities of color. Um, but I guess it did. And so now we know, <laughs> um, I hope that we don't go back to business as usual. I hope that we continue to empower black folks in positions of leadership in order to be at the table when these conversations are ha happening. I hope, I hope that we financially invest in communities and in interventions that are going to help our communities. Um, and back to the data piece, I hope we actually build up our systems to continue to collect data sets that will further inform the work that we're doing. Um, you know, I think that's the only way that we can really start to see large trends and then govern ourselves accordingly. Um, so hopefully this is not just a movement or a moment and a blip in time, right? Um, I hearken it back to, you know, our racial unrest, right? We know that the headlines move on. Right, the media starts to think about other things, right? And when the protests, it got cold, right? I'm, I'm in my office, I'm there at the Capitol, right? It get cold, people stop protesting. The, the media stops thinking about certain things, but our commitment to these issues can't wean when the cameras move on. And so I hope that even when the world stops watching and we move on to whatever is the next hot topic, that we continue to have the the conversations and the investment to actually start to move the needle. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with, with, with what's already been said. And in addition, you know, I just am hopeful for just increased in, in, in political engagement um, from from uh, people in our country. Uh, we, we've learned, uh, we've witnessed how fragile our democracy really is so much that we uh, take for granted. Uh, and so much of the mythology about America, you know, being, uh, in, you know, un, unpenetrable uh, is not true. You know, we are humans and we are, are you know, our, our institutions are fragile as well. And we need to, to value them and, and, you know, and invest in them and not tolerate, like have a zero tolerance for anyone who uh, spits lies or, um, you know, works to under undermine our democracy, um, you know, foreign or domestic. And so I'm hopeful for that and that people remain just more politically engaged um, and not just politically, but just in terms of activism, uh, you know, in, in, in their community, there's been so much going on in terms of you know, people being a, more giving and and charitable and and I you know I want to I want to see that because it's not just about um, you know politicians we have, you know we as as members of our own community can do so much more than than we realize and and so we have to put pressure on people in power but we also need to demand more of ourselves and each other um, to to be more. less. Um, individualistic and, and more community uh, more community minded 
Uh, and, and so I, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. And I'm hopeful that, that those are the things that will start to change. And one thing I, I noticed also is that, uh, you know, th during COVID-19, our government was able to make so many exceptions, you know, things that, that were, that were once no, suddenly, you know, they were able to give out checks and, you know, they were able to do a lot of things that, that in the past, you know, they weren't able to do. And so, you know, I hope that also there's a president that's made that we don't have to wait until a crisis, um, you know, for more uh, resources to be given to social services, but that uh, they are provided uh, more, read more readily and that we really take a look at wealth and equality in this country and really start reevaluating our priorities and because there were a lot of billionaires that were made during this crisis and that shouldn't have been um, allowed. And so when we say we don't have money, we need to be thinking about, well, what do we mean by we? And um, and really thinking about just the redistribution of, of uh, wealth in, a, in an equitable way um, will help to prevent things like COVID-19 from spreading the way that it has. Yes, yes, yes. That's really great. And so the the last question I have, is there anything that I have left out or anything that you want to say regarding um, race and disability? We talked uh, about a lot of these, you know, in this hour and 14 minutes. So is there any last comments that you have or anything that you think I, did, um, you know, left out, you know, did not ask that you would like to bring attention to um, for the, the people need to know as we help the race and disability? I, I would just say as a policymaker, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I I just was honored to, to spend I think, is it Thursday? This Thursday evening uh, on this panel. And if I wasn't talking a lot, it was because I was learning. And, you know, I am definitely not an expert in this field, but the fact you all invited me to share in the conversation has just been really dope. So like, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I will say, continue to show up, continue to hold every single elected official um, on every level accountable for serving disability, like the disability community, right? Um, whether it is at your city level, county, state, federal, um, communities that show up get the stuff, right? Uh, there is nothing more intimidating, nothing more, you want to make a politician sweat, show up to a meeting, write a letter and expect, a, and expect an answer back, right? And I think that is something that we all forget is that the folks who are in power are only empowered by us, by citizens, right? Who put them there. And I think it is our right to question what people are doing. And if they don't give you an answer that you um, find accessible, I would say take a little space to educate them on the issue, but then hold them accountable for getting what you think is important and what you need, right? Um, but continue to show up and hold politicians accountable. That's the only way that this space gets more equitable. Um, and more inclusive for everyone. So just thank you for allowing me to be here. This has been awesome. Yes, thank you for coming. Yeah, I want to thank you too for inviting me and I'm hope, hoping this has inspired somebody. And uh, like Representative Anthony said, we have to make sure we're holding other people accountable, but then we have to be accountable as well to ourselves and to the community that we live in. So, so those are some things I hope we all can work on Putting, making sure other people are accountable. And we see the difference with this election, this past election, we see the difference of, of making people accountable and voting. So we have to, you know, follow through, follow through. But th again, thanks for the opportunity to spend my Thursday night <laughs> with you all. This has been great. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, um, Tamika, for, again, for inviting all of us and, you know, putting us in in conversation with each other and I'm, I've also learned so much and um, you know the example of what's going on in Michigan you know even though I live in Illinois just learning about the advocacy and the, and the policies that are that people are working on there you know helps inform the work that I do so so thank you for that and you know I just you know want to encourage people to just stay engaged and you know I know that it's easy to get fatigued and and it's easy to get discouraged um, 
but we really need to stay vigilant and and not get comfortable, you know, um, and once we see a victory, uh, because victories can always be taken away and, um, and uh, you know, rights are, are never guaranteed to last forever and and not everyone has rights now so for so those of us who do have rights need to fight for those who don't uh and also just to build i want to encourage people to build coalition across community of difference i want to encourage more um you know black brown unity um i want to encourage an, um, more unity uh you know among um, people who are lgbtq i uh just 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 unity to work towards um equity 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 <laughs> and inclusion um because we can all be free and my freedom does not have to be you know um dependent on on your failure and and in fact i don't want that um so you know there's you know groups in power want us to believe that that we can't all be free and they they create you know opportunities where there's very little resources and and have us all fight for them and we need to resist that and say no we can all be free and be just as concerned about anti-black racism as we are about if you're black as we are about anti-race anti-asian sentiments that have been rising especially right now because of COVID-19 and 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 the misplaced anger towards um Asian folks um, that was um, encouraged by our president. And, you know, we, you know, so if you see injustice, um, as MLK said, a threat to justice somewhere is a threat to justice anywhere. I'm messing that all up, but it's something like that. <laughs> um, and I really believe that. And, and so we really need to, um, you know, work together because we can, we can have a better world if we believe that we can. All right. Yeah, you said it, said it great. <laughs> The last uh, thing, so I would like to thank all of you, Raquel, you know, Representative Anthony, Dr. Angel Miles, uh, for coming uh, today. Thank you to um, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition, uh, Brianna Alexander Oppenheiser, for, uh, you know, giving me this opportunity to, um, you know, host it create this facilitation. Um, I know there'll be more discussions in the future um, that I will be doing. So definitely stay tuned to Michigan of Disability Rights Coalition. So thank you very much and everybody have a great rest of your day. Mm -hmm.